The purpose of this video is to explain the last assignment for the year. This is an argumentative essay, which means that the writer takes a position on a topic of some controversy. The writer supports his position with reasoning, um, perhaps makes appeals to the audience's emotions or the audience's sense of right and wrong, but also primarily to the audience's ability to reason and to apply logic to a situation. So the topic that we'll be dealing with is the current COVID-19 crisis, the global pandemic, and the common use of wartime metaphors. Our overriding question is, are wartime metaphors suitable for dealing with this global pandemic? Are they suitable for our current times? So the fact that wartime metaphors are being used and have been used from the time this pandemic was recognized in the United States is a matter of record. I'm providing here a few quotations from various leaders that reinforce your understanding of the use of these metaphors. One quotation from President Donald Trump is, I view it as, a, in a sense, a wartime president. He, in a later speech, said, we must sacrifice together because we are all in this together and will come through together. It's the invisible enemy. Some of you may have been listening to Governor Andrew Cuomo's daily briefings about the situation in New York. At one point, Cuomo said, this is war, when referring to the spread of COVID throughout the city. The New York Times printed a headline saying, testing is just the beginning in the battle against COVID-19. So I think whether you have given it much thought or not, you're all probably pretty familiar with this rhetoric. And rhetoric is simply language, images, arguments that persuade an audience. And so this rhetoric is the way we talk about something and it shapes our perceptions of the subject. So some of you might say simply off the top of your head, well, yes, this is a suitable metaphor. Um, what we're dealing with is something unfamiliar. It requires a lot of fortitude to overcome. Um, it requires unity. And because we are all familiar with military jargon and military thinking, this is an appropriate metaphor for leaders to use in our times. But before you write your argument, I would like you to consider and research a little bit. So I've put a couple of different sources here. Um, I'm not looking for a fully researched essay with a work cited page and direct quotations. I am looking for your own informed thoughts about whether or not this language is, is suitable. Bye. And so I'm going to just click on a Google search. You can go out and do this on your own. But I simply put in war, metaphor, COVID. And you can see a lot of different sources discussing the use of war metaphors or military metaphors to talk about COVID-19. Uh, the first one is from April 8, 2020. It's from an online magazine called The Conversation. And it simply says, war metaphors used for COVID-19 are compelling, but also and then it goes on to say that these are tools of political rhetoric and they might um, misrepresent the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
Scientific American, which is a journal, April 17, 2020, says that these distort the reality of COVID-19. Um, so a lot of these sources are opposed to the use of war as a metaphor for the pandemic. And I would suggest that you open some that look interesting to you and that seem to be credible. And just look at the various arguments so that you can create an informed opinion. Now we'll go back. Um, the other source that I'm going to require that you use, because this is also a measurement of your understanding of reading, is the text, The Things They Carried. And last week I asked you to choose one of the vignettes in this novel by Tim O'Brien and read it so that you could apply this thinking to it. Um, if I were to read this first vignette, uh, this is about troops during the Vietnam War um, carrying their packs, their medication, their weapons as they hiked through the um, countryside in Vietnam. Uh, carrying out the policies of the United States government, which uh, were based on the desire to um, contain the spread of communism. And in the late 50s, when the United States became in involved in Vietnam, uh, North Vietnam was becoming a uh, sort of a communist government, just as China had done uh, about 10 years earlier. So this war came to a head in 1968. It was the event of that generation, of my generation. Um, the last American troops, I think, came out of Vietnam in 1973, and I was just a junior in high school at that time. So my classmates and I were a bit young for this direct involvement in this major historic event. Uh, none of our classmates had been drafted. We were too young at the time, uh, but we were intensely engaged in it. Uh, reports of the war were on television every night, just as news pandemic is news is, of the pandemic is today. And we read magazines. Um, and it was just a huge topic of conversation. So um, this particular book by Tim O'Brien is, many would say, um, a realistic exploration of the experience of troops in the war. It does take a somewhat critical stance against US policies, which was common at the time, but primarily, it's just exploring how the war affected young men and to a very uh, slight extent affected them after they returned to the U.S. at the end of the war. So um, we are using it as our evidence um, about warfare, about the reality of war. Now that can be disputed. Uh, Tim O'Brien was criticized maybe some eight or 10 years after the novel came out by some who felt that it wasn't a complimentary portrayal of troops and by some who felt that it uh, was critical of the US in a way that was unpatriotic. So it isn't without controversy, um, but it is also a book on our reading list and it is considered an American classic. Uh, it portrays a particular American identity of the period. So I'm asking that you accept the premise that these incidents reflected in O'Brien's novel can be considered the actual experience of wartime. So two primary sources then your own experience, which I don't have listed here, but it is, news articles, opinion pieces, and the things they carried.
So before you start writing, ask yourself some questions. Does this metaphor unify the public? Or, or in addition, does it minimize the war experience? Um, and by minimize, I mean, does it imply that these life-threatening situations far away from home that were experienced by young men are equal to those of young people today who are um, unable to attend school, who are somewhat isolated in their homes, or um, whose parents have lost their jobs. So that's one question. Is the metaphor appropriate? Is it fair to both sides? Does the metaphor provide a helpful response to the pandemic? Um, does thinking about an invisible enemy and uh, engagement in attacks or ambushes, does that help the public respond to the pandemic? And also, is it accurate? Is this comparison um, based on an accurate perception of both the COVID virus and of wartime? So, um, here's the task. Agree or disagree with the statement. The wartime metaphor is suitable in these times of a global pandemic. So you need to develop a line of reasoning. If you think it's a suitable response for leaders and it's a suitable way to think, what is your reasoning for that? Is it because the comparison is accurate and valid? Is it because the comparison unifies and mobilizes the public? Is it why? What is your line of reasoning? And if you don't think it's suitable, what is your reasoning for that? Uh, for what reasons do you think that it might be um, unfair or um, dismissive of soldiers who had engaged in battle? to compare them to, uh, say, hospital workers who are um, carrying out their duties to the best of their abilities in a hospital setting. Um, what is your reasoning for saying that the metaphor does not give the public the proper response or that somehow it could be manipulated by a leader for political gain? So what's your line of reasoning? And certainly those articles um, on that global search can help you. So you have your reasons, and then you do need to back up the reasons with evidence. It's not enough to say, I believe this because of this. You need to show that this is real. And so personal experience can be used, news sources, facts, and you must have evidence from the things they carried to show how the parallel is appropriate or not. Um, this is a sample um, outline and I've got a little typo on here. I'll fix it on the version that I post on the assignment, but wartime metaphors do or do not provide leaders with an appropriate line of thinking about the COVID crisis. So you're going to argue one or the other. Come up with three reasons. I've stated three reasons here uh, that could be used either way. The metaphor calls the virus an invisible enemy, which does perhaps or does not relate to modern guerrilla and terrorist warfare. So is the virus invisible in somewhat the same way that guerrilla fighters were invisible in Vietnam? hiding in trees, almost never seen. And when you read the things they carry, you'll see that very few vignettes actually depict any Vietnamese enemy. I think there's only one, uh, The Man I Killed, and it is a very personal look at a young man that Tim O'Brien, the character, kills. And it's a you know, regrettable experience. So it, she's not even portrayed as a real threat. So um, certainly that passage supports the idea that the 
metaphor is, is not appropriate, that it doesn't really relate to the real experience. Another point might be the rhetoric of war does or does not mobilize people. Um, is it effective in convincing people to wear masks and social distance and to go to work when they might become infected? Does the rhetoric of war mobilize them? Does it inspire them? Uh, just as soldiers had been drafted and mobilized in wartime. So again, you'll look at the Tim O'Brien piece, if this is one of your points, and um, I think it's way to Rainy River uh, tells of his receiving the draft notice and his fear about going to war and his fear about not going and standing up against something that most of his family and friends believed in. So uh, is it somewhat the same that we are drafted into positions that we don't really want to be in and that perhaps recognizing that this is somehow for the greater good of our um, country might mobilize us, might give us the motivation to wear the mask or to keep our distance. So I think you're beginning to see the way you can use these reasons either way. Um, does the suffering of COVID patients an essential worker compare to the suffering of soldiers and families in wartime? If you believe it does, then that might be a reason that this rhetoric can be effective. It helps maybe give purpose to physical pain or even death. And it helps perhaps give purpose to workers who are providing food or services for the larger public. So you might say, yes, it uh, is great rhetoric in helping to dignify people's efforts. Or you might say, no, this has little to do with the kind of suffering that soldiers and families undergo in wartime. And again, you'll look back to the things they carry to support that point. Um, in one of the passages, Norman Bowker, who's a, a vet, comes home to a great sense of loss. Uh, we would call it PTSD today, and is unable to re-socialize. He can't fit in with society. So is that something that we would compare to uh, this six-foot social distancing that we have to undergo for a couple of months, you know, some would say no. Um, in that first vignette, uh, one of the troops, uh, Lemon is his name, is blown up. He steps on a landmine, and the narrator depicts, um, you know, this loss of life. And can we compare that to what people uh, suffer when they are ventilated or um, when they're at home sick? So you need to make those decisions. But these are just reasons that you might think about and might use. Whatever your reasoning is, you must be supported with explanation and evidence. So this is this same paragraph structure that you have been exposed to over and over again. State your reason clearly in the first sentence. This rhetoric helps people unify. Okay, very clear and simple. State your reason and then explain what you mean by that. Identifying with soldiers and wartime struggles um, is something that everyone understands and universally responds to, okay? Then you need to set up and go to your evidence, okay? I personally, you know, have responded by whatever it is, your mask with the American flag on it or whatever it is, or you give some news information. Um, people in shopping areas, da da da, whatever it is, and then you also um, perhaps might first of all establish what the military metaphor is by pointing to something from the things they carried. And you might say, you know, in Tim O'Brien's novel, um, the soldiers were unwilling participants, just as we are unwilling 
participants in this COVID effort. And maybe you give a character's name, you might have a brief quotation, um, you might just cite a situation from the book. Um, O'Brien gets in his boat and, and goes to Canada. He's thinking about leaving the country. So that shows how reluctant he was to participate. Um, do we see people reluctant to participate in this effort? Uh, maybe having a party, maybe refusing to wear a mask. You know, are these the same sorts of personal responses to uh, being forced to do something? You can't just end though with the evidence. You need to explain how it relates to the reason. And you can keep in your mind, this shows you know, when people gather together for a party in the midst of a, a stay-at-home rule, uh, they are expressing their extreme reluctance to follow, um, you know, these government guidelines. So that is evidence that the military metaphor hasn't worked or Maybe it's evidence that people haven't heard the military metaphor enough. And if they had heard it, they wouldn't be gathering. I don't know. You know, you can do any number of things with evidence. Uh, this is a very fully developed paragraph when you have two pieces of evidence. And, and that's fine. You can have one that's well developed. You might need to go on to another bit of evidence. Um, especially if you're trying to show how the things they carried is applicable because you're going to have something from personal experience and then you're going to have something from the, the novel. And with each bit of evidence, whether it's a situation, a blended quotation, or a fact, you need to explain how it relates to the reason. And then end the paragraph by explaining how the reason supports your point. How long does this need to be? Um, I'm not looking for a fully researched three-page essay, as I said. I'm looking for an argument that is convincing, that has a line of reasoning. If you can do that with an introduction and two well-developed uh, body paragraphs that can both contain um, uh, significant evidence for your point, then you can do that. Maybe you have the sort of argument that requires that you develop it with some short evidence for reasons that lead into the next. And in that case, you might have three body paragraphs. But when you get to the end of your paper, in order to write an effective argument, you need to consider the counter argument. Okay, what would the opposition say? What would a person opposed to you say? Okay, and the idea isn't to attack it, to disrespect it, or be dismissive of it. The idea is to address it. So if I'm saying that this military metaphor doesn't really work, that it misleads people about the science, about the reality of the disease, that it can lead to hateful acts and... Um, somehow aligns the experience of a glorified war um, with the COVID virus and that that glorified war experience isn't valid in and of itself, that actually warfare is plugging along doing as you're told. So I might say, you know, um, I understand the opposition. I understand that some people like military metaphors and that they think it creates a sense of patriotism and loyalty. Um, and so I can either concede that, I can say, you know, that's true and there is some truth to it, but the uh, better route would be to take a different form of rhetoric. Um, or I can simply refute it and say, you know, that's faulty. People really don't respond to that. Instead, they just get sort of angry and rebel. So you need to examine the counterclaim, and you can do that toward the end of the paper. You can do it in the conclusion with just a couple of sentences, and I think that's perfectly fine. If you really want to go after or refute the opposition's argument, 
then you can do it in a fully developed paragraph right before your conclusion. And these are some ways to do that. So um, that's the end of this slideshow. And um, I'm putting the slideshow on the assignment. Um, I'd suggest you look at it. You can stop it in places, but um, it's kind of meant to give you some guidelines. So please email me with questions and I'll be happy to help.